All right, everybody. Uh, here we are for episode 58. Uh, we do want to make a correction from last week's show. If you're listening to the audio only version that we did, uh, we said Michelle Yeoh was on one of the Netflix Marvel shows. She was actually in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. So we just confused which uh, program that was. So just a correction there. Um, this week, we, we last week we did Women in Action. This week, as you can see, we're focusing on one person, and that is the magnificent Jean Claude Van Damme. The Universal Soldier Kicksboxer. Kicksboxer? <laughs> Kicksboxer. I don't really understand how to speak the words that are coming out of my mouth, apparently. He was the star of Kickboxer. My personal favorite is Universal Soldier. Uh, we got Bloodsport back here, and then Expendables 2. I realize I don't own a lot of his movies on DVD. I do own some more on uh, Digital, Sudden Death, Time Cop, Hard Target. Um, but I am a fan, and there are a lot streaming on... Um, uh, Amazon Prime. So if you have Amazon Prime and you're like, I need Van Damme. Would you would you agree that uh, his uh, just overall performance got better or worse after the mullet went away? Um, for me, I kind of miss it, but I think I, it actually did get better. It, so. Yeah, I would say he's the mullet was something that needed to be left in the past. However, I think it does help uh, with performances in Hard Target and Time Cop. The mullet is definitely something. Um, worthy of have, having i would say if that makes sense i don't i don't know words well um so but his, his career is an interesting one too because he he kind of started out you know obviously he's big into martial arts and stuff um uh the muscles from brussels that's his nickname mm -hmm. as everyone, people should know him for that he's from brussels uh he speaks fluent french uh which will come up in one of the movies we review this week um I would have been amazing if he was just faking his way through that movie, movie that we're going to review. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, so he really, you know, he was in Breakin, I'm sure, just because he could move and stuff like that. Uh, no Retreat, No Surrender was his first, like, big movie, um, but that he was a villain. And then Bloodsport, that was the first movie where mm -hmm. he really showed that he could kind of command an audience. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the stock in Baby Oil and Johnson & Johnson's <laughs> went through the roof. And that's is that the one that he does a little the little dance in? Is it blood sport or is that kick? I can't remember which one is. Which uh, one. I'm gonna be honest, they all kind of run together. <laughs> they do. So. A lot of his '80s and early '90s stuff feel very similar. Uh, you know, the one that matters for me the most: sudden death. Sudden death. Hockey and Jean Claude. Oh, oh, swoon. That is one of those movies that I've always kind of. I've always considered it. We'll say a guilty pleasure, but. I read, read recently someone who doesn't like the word guilty pleasure because it makes it sound like it's, you know, the quality isn't as great and stuff. He's like, if you just like the movie, just like the movie. So I like Sudden Death. It's it's a silly movie at times, but Van Damme just, like you said, the element, adding the element of hockey, obviously it helps that as Blackhawk fans, the Blackhawks are one of the teams Ooh, in the movie. Yeah, they lose the... You know, they, well, they were, I mean, they weren't that great at that time either. They were, it was the 90s, so... That was when they were playing in the Stanley Cup Finals. Oh, was it? Okay, so... so I, I stand corrected. Uh, I, uh, do you want to talk about one of the most epic collapses? Uh, <laughs> Mario, Mario Lemieux and Yalmir Yager decided, you know what, we don't want you guys to really have a chance in this series anymore, and uh, just jerks. steamrolled them. Uh, so they, but again, we're talking about epic mullets. Yes, there we are. At the perfect time. And what's funny is he really kind of cut his mullet for the most part for that movie, which would have been perfect for that movie. Powers Booth plays the villain in that film. Uh, they kidnap his kid, right? And then they ha he has to go and rescue them. They are going to blow up the arena because, of course, because they want money. There's really not a whole lot to, like... That's the plot, essentially, to most Van Damme movies, I want to say, unless it's during a karate tournament. Those are the only different ones, like Kickbox or Bloodsport. Um, yeah, I always had a soft spot for that movie. I don't know what it was, if it was just the time that we grew up in the 90s, but Sudden Death has always been one of those ones that I, I would watch it. I've probably seen it like 10 times, just because it was it always used to be on HBO and Cinemax back in the day. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's got that speed aspect to it where there's, you know... You're right. Yep. The uh, the stakes are you know through the roof, pun intended, because yes. they're crawling around on the roof. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is yeah. It's one of those movies that if you kind of want to see like what um, an action movie should look like in the '90s, that pretty much follows that that look. Uh, directed by Peter Hyams, you have Van Damme. We already talked about Powers Booth, Dorian uh, Harewood. Um, yeah, it's just 
a really fun movie. I'm not sure if that one's streaming. It might be on Amazon right now. My goal this week is to find out what Powers Booth real name is, because that is one of the most <laughs> epic stage names I have ever heard. Uh, Powers Booth's name is, uh, no joke, Wayne, his name is actually Powers. Hmm. He was born Powers Allen Booth. Wow. So there you go. His parents knew when he was born. They're like, this, he is going to be an actor, and he's going to play a villain a lot. Yeah. I mean, you know, there was a time I went as Dirk Strongwood, but that's a different story for a different time. <laughs> it's a different podcast. Um, <laughs> now show me with Mike and Wade after dark. <laughs> so the movie did actually gross sixty four million dollars in a thirty five million dollar budget. So not a huge hit by any stretch, but for Van Damme, I think in nineteen ninety five, pretty pretty nice. Almost doubled the money. So yeah, right, exactly. Pretty nice uh, take there for that movie. I don't really think anybody would be mad at that. I know I wouldn't. There was unfortunately a. And they're calling it a remake on here, but I know it's on Netflix. It's called Welcome to Sudden Death with Michael J. White and Gary Owen. Um, it's more a more co comedic take, as it says, on the material. So they basically, what you're seeing these days is you're seeing actors remake or do sequels to old movies that no one cares about anymore. And then they just pop on Netflix and they try to make them different and... Uh, you know, they're just trying to get that audience that still watches those movies. There's a well, there's a, quite a few kickboxer films, too. He wasn't in two or three, but then he's been in, like, uh, Van Damme's been in the most recent, like, two or three of them that they've come out. So uh, one of them's supposed to be good. I haven't seen it yet. Um, but Sudden Death, like we said, that's a, a kind of like a underrated classic, I would say. Uh, check that one out if you haven't seen it. Um, but Bloodsport, like I was talking about, that was the one that kind of shot him to fame, Wayne. He uh, was known for kicking people in the face, and mm -hmm. that was the, the movie that showcased that the most. This was right around the same time, because I believe he left Predator, where he was supposed to be Predator, mm -hmm. to do Bloodsport. And the main reason he left Predator is before he, when he was on the set, you could look it up online, Google original Predator costume, it looked super uncomfortable. Yeah. And he hated it. He couldn't move in it. He couldn't breathe in it. And so he left. And then when he left, they created the Predator costume that we all know today, uh, which is which a little bit, you know, it's probably still claustrophobic, but the mask was a lot more form-fitting to the face. So it wasn't like it was ridiculous. Like it had like a ridiculous snout on it and, and stuff before. So really we owe this version of Predator to Jean-Claude. We do for him having the cojones to step away from what was going to you know, ended up being a huge action flick of the 80s uh, because he felt uncomfortable. Okay. <laughs> so thank you, Jean-Claude Van Damme. Indeed. Um, so, yeah, Bloodsport, one of the many uh, movies um, that people, I think, relate to him. Obviously, uh, Bolo Jung is the um, main villain, and he's been a main villain in many of these movies. Yep. Um, that's kind of what the movie is known for. Um I can't remember if this is one where his brother gets killed and then he has... That happens all... Like, when you talk like Van Damme, Seagal, Stallone, all their movies from the 80s and 90s are all the same, essentially. It's just like, former military man's brother gets kidnapped and he has to go save the day. And then the next the next movie is, his, his daughter has been kidnapped and he's got to go save the day. And Seems like he needs to develop a very specific set of skills. <laughs> exactly. Um, so it revolves around U.S. Army captain. U.S. First off... Yeah. U.S. Army Captain from Belgium, uh, Frank Dux, or Dukes, has trained in the way of ninjutsu under his sensei, Senzo Tanaka, played by Roy Chow. As a boy, Dukes and a group of his friends broke into Tanaka's home, and he teaches them karate, blah, blah, blah. Uh, after arriving in Hong Kong, Dukes befriends American fighter Ray Jackson. I think that's what happens. And then that guy, it's kind of like a Rocky thing where... Um, Duck. They killed Apollo Creed! Exactly. It's basically like that. And so, you know, then he has to, like... Or Jackson's in the hospital, so maybe he's not dead. But he's put in the mm -hmm. hospital. As you can tell, I haven't seen Bloodsport in a while. It's a solid flick if you like these karate action well, th flicks. Then I'm getting it confused with Kickboxer, where <laughs> uh, he goes to fight in this tournament, and yes. he's got a, a, a army buddy or a military buddy who's also fighting. Yes. I believe <laughs> they're like... It's like a double dragons type thing. So that's more like a Mortal Kombat style, like fight tournament right. type thing. I like Kickboxer a lot. Um, it's again, that's another one that's been a while since I've seen it. Uh, but he really, like I said, you know, Bloodsport and then Kickboxer, and this is where he kind of starts to see his star rise um, and basically kind of have his pick of movies he wants to do. He did Cyborg in the same year, in 1989. Followed that up with Lionheart, uh, Death Warrant, and then in 1991, when we get the um, 
what happens to every action star after a while. It's like, well, why can't there be two of them? And so we get double impact where you have twin Van Dams uh, directed by Sheldon Leadich, uh, written and produced by starring and starring Jean-Claude Van Damme as Chad and Alex Wagner. Very American names for, for Frenchmen. See, that's a missed opportunity. It should have been Chad and Brad. Yes, it should I have mean, been Chad and Brad. Missed You're opportunities. Right. Yeah. Um, let's see. It looks like Bolo Young is uh, returns, I believe. Uh, he's not in the main cast, but yeah, he's so he's in this as well. Um, this one, uh, 1966, business partners Paul Wagner and Nigel Griffith open the Hong Kong Victoria Harbor Tunnel. Paul attends with his wife and their twin infant sons, Chad and Alex. After the celebration, the family is followed home by their bodyguard, Frank Avery, whom they dismiss. Once he leaves, the triad hit squad follows them, uh, kills the family. Uh, Paul's wife begs the triad to spare the twins, but is killed by Moon, Bolo Ying, uh, the top henchman. Their maid is able to escape with Alex, and Frank eventually saves Chad. And uh, the maid leaves Alex at a Hong Kong orphanage, and Frank raises Chad in France. So you've got two twin brothers whose parents tragically die. They're raised by different families, and then they end up coming together to, like, avenge their parents' death, essentially. Um, it's a silly movie, but I remember when this one came out, it was it was very popular. I'm not going to lie, man. It sounds like Star Wars. <laughs> it really, yeah. It's, not, it's two right. boys instead of Luke and Leia. <laughs> You're right, it does. And they don't make out, I don't think, at one point. Even though I'm sure Van Damme would have loved to make out with himself. You know, I talked about missed opportunities, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Here's another one. Uh, budget on that one was 15 to 16 million, made 30, so double, about double what it cost. Um, again, these movies back then, they weren't. A lot of what their money potential was was home video, especially yeah. after the VHS boom in the 80s, when that's when the VHS movies came out. It wasn't. It was how much you could make in the theater, but a lot of these movies, even those, even though back then majority of movies were made only for theaters they started thinking like okay this movie maybe we're going to make 15 to 20 million in theaters but when it hits home video that's really where we're going to make all the money because people are going to rent the crap out of it i'm very happy that you brought up this topic because we need to address something at the end of the show about uh, what's going on with disney yes yes so, I, I have that written down we will get to that yeah. there's uh, some other stuff interesting stuff to bring up not that to derail the well. show at all but yeah that's <laughs> it's something that's come up between our last show and this one that yes. needs to be addressed because Exactly, exactly. But, um, you know, I'm just, you know, again, making double what it costs to make the movie. You know, in the 90s, you know, I'd love to know what the mathematical equivalent of making, you know, $30 million would fifteen million budget, today. Yeah, you know, yeah. So you're talking probably a good, you know, $60 million plus. I would say, yeah. Or so, more. And that's not, you know, you look at it, that's not a bad number. Right. Um, so following Double Impact, again, I've said my favorite, and this right here, Universal Soldier. I don't know why it's my favorite. Maybe I just I watched it a bunch as a kid. Mm -hmm. I, you know, it's it's uh, sci-fi directed by Roland Emmerich. Everyone knows him from Independence Day, director of Independence Day, 2012, Day After Tomorrow, basically any disaster movie ever. Um, this is one of his earlier ones, and it stars Jean Claude Van Damme, karate uh, and um, biochemist uh, Dolph Lundgren, mad scientist, if you will, uh, in real life. Ali Walker, uh, Edo Ross, and Jerry Orbach. This is a movie about soldiers that go, uh, that are overseas and they get killed. Uh, Luke Devereaux is, mm -hmm. uh, is Jean-Claude Van Damme. They've made several sequels to this franchise as well. Um, he, I believe in this one, he's in all of them. He's not the main character necessarily in all of them, but in the first two he is, and then I think in the other ones, he makes like a cameo appearance, which is right. weird because they're cyborgs, but obviously he's much older. So it's kind of hard to be like, how did you age, man? You know, it's, <laughs> like, it's like the T-800, man, living, yeah. living tissue over endoskeleton. Um, exactly. So uh, him and Dolph The more Lundgren, I interact with humans, the more I learn. <laughs> him and Dolph Lundgren are two of these soldiers, and they are uh, essentially, they bring these soldiers back to life kind of as robots, where it's like they have no memory of what they were, but they're cyborgs, essentially. Um, and they use them as, like, their own, like, attack force, like, in the United States. So they're part of the military wing, mm. and they unleash them on towns that, like, need to be... Like, if someone steals something or whatever, that's what it is, is there's, someone, there's a piece of tech that's out there or whatever, and they have to go get it back. So they send these soldiers out to go recover it. But then Jean-Claude Van Damme's character, Luke Devereaux, starts getting his memories back of when he was alive. Right. Remembering who he was. 
Uh, we've seen this time and time again since this, probably a couple times before 1992. Um, but it's just, I don't know, it's just such a cool story. Dolph Lundgren plays such a great villain, I think, to Van Damme. Um, it was kind of interesting to have them two karate champions. They do get to do some hand-to-hand combat stuff, but a lot of guns are involved in this franchise. So yep. there, there's not as much hand-to-hand combat, I think, as people were probably expecting. Uh, but I, I always really enjoyed this film. Um, it's one of those ones, you know, on a rainy Sunday afternoon, pop on Universal Soldier. Now my wife hates it, so I don't get to watch it as much as I would like. But, you know, that's just what it is. Um, it, yeah, it, it I don't really know what else to say about it. When do you have any thoughts on Universal Soldier? I'm sure you probably haven't seen it in a while. Yeah, it's been a good five to ten years since yeah. I've watched it. But yeah, you know, growing up, classic, you know, shoot them up, bang, bang. Yep. You know, it's, you watch something like that, it's like, this has to be directed by Michael Bay, right? <laughs> oh, wait, no. Close. It was, it was, yeah, one of his uh, kind of after, or like predecessor, or not predecessors, what is the one to come after? I don't know, whatever. Uh, they came around. They came up around the same time, basically. Michael Bay and, and Roland Emmerich. Um, they both like to blow things up. So um, it's got a low Rotten Tomato score. However, this movie, though, so th- again, it's adjusting for inflation. I'm not sure how much it would be, but it made 95 million dollars on a 23 million dollar budget. So pretty solid uh, box office return. Mm-hmm. Um, it led to four se- or three sequels: uh, Universal Soldier of the Return, which was actually in theaters, and I, me and my buddy Jason Larson went and saw it in theaters. So yeah, if, if you can find Universal Soldier out there, usually it's on Amazon Prime. Go check that one out. Uh, he does have a cameo in Last Action Hero, which is fun. I, re- I remember that because it's that's a whole like big action movie, uh, tongue in cheek meta film. Um, oh, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember they were walking through yeah. the blockbuster yeah, and yeah, still yeah. Well, in the like, yep. Terminator Two. Mm-hmm. What, are you, what yeah. are you talking about? This is best was best work to do date. <laughs> that was you. Uh, that's a great movie. Well, I could have a whole conversation about last section. Oh yeah, and there are people that absolutely hate it, and I love it. Oh, I so absolutely love it. It's one of those movies. We're getting off topic here, but Last Action Hero is one of those films that has over time has garnered um, a lot of love. It, yeah. When it came out, it wasn't very well liked. It was kind of ahead of its time. Mm-hmm. And now people are realizing the tongue cheek and the uh, meta that it was back then. And now that's more popular these days than right. it was back then. And then not to dwell on that, because we will need to get to the movie yeah. someday. Yes. But I think we can both agree that we both wanted to be the kid in that movie yeah. oh, with the magic course. ticket. Of course. Heck yeah, dude. Back in our time, yeah, that would have been amazing. Um, so... 90, the end of 93 to 94 is when you get a string of, like, not critically successful films. Uh, one, really awful, but two that I kind of like, Wayne. Uh, one being Hard Target. This was We had back-to-back mm-hmm. mullets. Hard Target and Time Cop. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hard Target, 1993, directed by John Woo. Uh, one of his, I think that's his American debut, I believe. Um, starring Jean-Claude Van Damme, Lance Hengritsen, uh Yancey Butler, and Wilford Brent. Of course, Wilford Brimley is amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, he plays like his uncle. And now in this movie, it's very interesting. He is actually French. And and they make Wil, uh, Wilford Brimley do like a kind of Cajun French accent throughout this movie. So they actually do kind of hone in on like, hey, it's an actual French person. Why do I not remember that at all? Wow. Okay. Well, time to revisit that one. I just rewatched it recently and I didn't remember it either. I'm like, wait a minute. He's speaking with a French accent. And obviously Van Damme is because he, he's one of those actors that can't, like Arnold, can't hide his accent. Yeah. Just, and um, don't ask him to either. Please. Right. Exactly. So uh, a box office of this one, $74 million on a $19 million, million dollar budget. Another successful film for him. See, and people wonder, you know, you look back at these movies and people are like, how did these get made? Or why did he get to make so many of them? It's because people would go see them. People yeah. love to watch these movies mm-hmm. that beat them up, shoot them up films where – Van Damme is wearing some really tight jeans and kicking people in the face. According to this, uh, Wu wanted uh, Kurt also Russell. Also with the mullet. If yes, with the mullet. Making those, drawing those connections. I'm sorry, Kurt Russell. John Wu wanted Kurt Russell for the role, but he was too busy. Also uh, doesn't look very good in a uh, tank top. So. And so, you <laughs> know, he doesn't. It looks a little different in a tank top. So John Wu then went to uh, <laughs> Universal's initial choice of having Van Damme star in the film. So... Kurt Russell wasn't available. He went with the next mullet in line, and that was Van Damme. That works. And uh, it's a pretty – it's a killer mullet, too, because it's got like – it is like all kind of like um, Bart Simpson up top and then the nice mullet in the back. you got to get the spiky – yeah, it's not just the business. It's but a you Kentucky get the waterfall, man. That with thing. the flow. Woo! And if you get the little cuts in on the side there, you, you know, you're just onto something. So. Yes. Uh, of course, a sequel to this was made without him 23 years later. 
Uh, never mm-hmm. saw it. Don't care to see it. Um, in New Orleans, a homeless veteran named Douglas Bender is the target of a hunt. So this, that's right. This one is hard target is kind of like um, this movie, The Hunt, that just came out last year, or uh, Surviving the Game with uh, uh, Ice T. It's basically hunting humans, and Van Damme's character kind of gets involved in it because. I believe that's what it is, is they, like, hunt somebody that he knew. So he, like, is out for revenge. Mm-hmm. And then he, be, you know, becomes the target. And there's lots of cool slow-mo effects. There's the, the arrow shooting, like, at, at the, the slow motion, like, arrow shooting and stuff like that. Because there's a lot of, like, bow and arrow and crossbow and shit in this movie um, for some reason. Um, Arno Vaslo plays uh, the or right-hand man to Lance Henriksen. So he was always that guy back in the day, too. Like, you need a henchman. Go to the guy from the who would eventually end up being the mummy. Uh, he's another one who has a difficult time hiding his uh, South African accent. Uh, he's gotten better at it, but so I don't want to give away the whole plot to this movie. But there's a lot of hard kick in action, a lot of Van Dam, a lot of explosions. Uh, very fun movie. Um, I still enjoyed it uh, watching it a couple like a month or two ago. Uh, it, it's yeah, I, you know, it's one of those movies. I think it actually holds up better than probably when it came out in the nineties. Nice. So. Nice little... Uh, Unfortunately, that's stealth. a rarity for Van Damme. Movies. It is, it is. Uh, Time Cop was the one that followed right after that. That is the one um, directed... Another one directed by Peter Hyams. Um, starring, of course, Jean-Claude Van Damme. And uh, let's see the rest of the cast here. Mia Sarah, Ron Silver, Bruce McGill. Um, you recognize a lot of these people if you watch the movie. It's a, a cop who kind of... Think like... Minority Report-ish, but in this one they actually go back in time instead of like knowing what happens in the future. They, you know, they they send someone back in time to stop anomalies in time. So kind of like Loki, the new the Loki series is the best comparison to Time Cop. Uh, Owen Wilson and the TVA are Time Cop, and Loki is the bad guy, I guess. Uh, who was I forget who it was. Uh, oh, Ron Silver. That's right, Ron Silver, the late Ron Silver, always played these type of roles. Uh, he was really good at this. Um, again, this is another one I watched again recently. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It's cheesy. Tom Cop's a cheesy movie. Um, it, do, do the uh, Does the science hold up? I don't know. <laughs> but it's Tom Cop. That's how it matters. It's got a great name. I'm going to guess it doesn't because we don't have time travel yet. <laughs> this is true. That we're aware of. Yeah, you're right. It, eventually, uh, that'll happen. Again, this is another one. A sequel was made. Uh, Jason Scott Lee and Thomas Ian Griffith from Karate Kid, uh, uh, part three, were in this movie. Um, I never saw the second one. Again, it was one of those properties Universal owned, and they're like, hey, let's do a a quick DVD sequel. Um, That was like in 2003, so that was a little while ago now. Um, We can't – this isn't a good movie, but we can't talk about Jean-Claude Van Damme and not talk about 1994's Street Fighter, Wayne. (laughs) <laughs> that right there, that reaction <laughs> is why most people don't want to talk about Street Fighter. <laughs> when you heard they're making a Street Fighter movie, and I don't know how much of a fan you were of the game. I was a huge fan. I, I was mean, excited. I, I knew of it. I, I, I thought it was yeah. cool. I didn't, I'm not a big fighting sport, uh, video game fighting fighters. I don't, yeah, I get bored. But yeah, I, you know, so much hype going into this. And, yep. Oh, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Well, there's so many characters in this in this franchise. They cast the Brussels or the muscles from Brussels, the Frenchman, to play the all-American Guile, who's supposed to be like the the epitome of like U.S. Army. Mm-hmm. Like, so you already have this main character with this thick French accent, yeah. who's supposed to be super American. So right then and there, you're you're kind of throwing us for a loop. Right. Oh, you know, you bring up the name of the character, and there's a lot of turmoil and yeah. back and forth. It's Gully. No, it's yeah. Guile. It's Gully. No, it's Guile. <laughs> and I, to this day, I don't know how to pronounce it properly. So I'll, I'll go with your pronunciation, yes. and hey, that works. I've always said Guile. Uh, Stephen E. DeSosa directed it. It starred Jean-Claude Van Damme, the late Raul Julia, who died uh, basically like right after they finished filming. Yeah. Uh, so this would go on to be his last film. Uh, people always feel bad for him. <laughs> this was his last movie. I get it, but honestly, if you watch it, and I've seen this within the last five, five, six years or so, since I've been in Florida, so the last four years actually, um, he's really good in this movie. Like he knew what movie he was in, Raul Julia, and he knew exactly how to do it. 
Yes. And his line delivery is amazing. He, he gives a fantastic performance. Everybody else is kind of trying to figure out what the hell they're supposed to be doing. He knew what he was doing, and it, it worked out really well for him. Deranged and unhinged, if I yes. remember correctly. Yes. Well, the whole, you know, uh, there's the line that uh, he says to um, Chun-Li, uh, Ming Na Win, and it's, um, you know, for you, the day that M. Bison came into your village and killed your entire family was the worst day of your life. For me, it was Tuesday. Yeah, so, and the way he delivers that line, it's just like holy shit. And this is like a kids' fighting movie, like, but it's like he just the way he delivers it, it's fantastic. Um, but again, the movie itself is terrible. This is no way uh, a promotional like go watch the movie. It's an awful movie with a really pretty solid cast. Uh, Damien Ch- Chapa is in it. Kylie Minogue plays. Um, let me go down to her character. Sonia. Uh, no, wrong, wrong franchise. <laughs> uh, Cammy. Uh, Damien Chapa plays Ken. Um, Simon Callow's an, an official, I guess. Uh, Byron Mann plays Ryu. Uh, Dasim is played by Roshan Seth. Uh, Wes Studi uh, plays Saget in the movie. Um, Glenn, Grand L. Rush plays Balrog. Uh, Andrew Brunarski plays Zangief. He was pretty good. He would go on. He was in the program. He was Latimer in the program. Yes. He was in Any Given yes. Sunday. He'd go on to be uh, Leatherface in the two... Texas Chainsaw movies from 2003 and 2005, I think. Were those the Jessica Biel versions? Yeah, the first Jessica okay. Biel was in the remake, and then he he returned for the it was a prequel called the I think Texas Chainsaw: The Beginning mm. with uh, Jordana Brewster. Um, so uh, Miguel A. Nunez, a. Nunez Jr. Uh, as DJ. So a lot of the characters are here: Jay Tavera as Vega, uh, Peter Taizopa as Honda. Um, so y- you get these characters from this game and they look the part, but there's just nothing there really. There re- it really is just like, it was like they tried to do Street Fighter mixed with a typical Van Damme type movie. Mm. And it's also like they never played a video game a day of their life. <laughs> like it just, it didn't, it, or all they saw were the end screens. Cause there is one big, that it movie ends on a freeze frame. You know, my favorite thing. Mm-hmm. It's them doing their, you know, their video game pose though. So all the characters do their video game pose at the end in one big screen, all the surviving characters in one big screenshot. It was terrible. It was wow. just, it wasn't good. Um, it, it, yeah, it struggled. Van Damme was not the right choice. As much as I love the guy, he was not the right choice for that movie. Um, there's a lot of reasons that went wrong, but if if you want to have a good time uh, with a bunch of friends, get together, drink some some beverages, mm-hmm. whatever, uh, smoke something. I don't know. Uh, it's not a bad. It's it's a good bad movie to watch because it's so awful. Right. Um, with some redeeming qualities like uh, Raul Julia. How- I, I, just a real real quick question. Does doesn't Gully or Guile in the game do something with his hair? He's yes. known for his hair, right? Yes, which Van Damme really they didn't do anything with his hair. Okay. I think they made it blonde, but they he didn't have like the. I know what you're talking. He's got kind of like the spiky, wavy hair. Yeah. And they, yeah, he doesn't have it. He's wearing a hat most of the time in the movie. Interesting. Um, it made, that ruins it for me. Yep, yes, what, that was what ruined it for me. It almost made a hundred million dollars in a thirty-five million dollar budget. So again, successful. Another successful <clears throat> film from Jean Claude Van Damme in the nineties. <clears throat> So after the you know the Street Fighter he like we uh, he went and did um, the Quest Maximum Risk uh, Double Team Dennis Rodman when everyone thought maybe he could be a movie star what's up Worm <laughs> I don't know what they were thinking um, I saw this movie in theaters with my buddy uh, Jason again we used to see all these movies in the I theaters. have to ask did you prefer Dennis Rodman as an actor or as a professional wrestler honestly as an actor. <laughs> Remember, you know, that was the, the WCW days where they were just pulling everybody. Remember oh, Steve McMichael was a wrestler? Jay and, Leno? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, anybody that was anybody, that they were pulling them in and trying to get ratings. Oh, yeah, no. When, uh, when I think it was Jay Leno, Leno versus Rodman, wasn't it? Wasn't I don't that one of the fights? Recall it. I just remember Vince McMahon versus Dermf. Yeah. And the, the <laughs> Shave Your Head match. God. Golly. So stupid. Um. Let's see. Yeah, so Double Team, bad. Bad Double Team. Let's look at a little bit of statistics about Double Team. Uh, let's see. Great poster. Van Damme, Rodman. I like it. Van Damme, Rodman, Rourke. Mickey Rourke, uh, the villain uh, in that one. I completely forgot that he was even in that movie, to be honest. See, I did until I saw it. Oh. See, and this is where you can see his career starting to slip a little bit. It made $48 million 
uh, but it costs thirty million. So only eighteen million over its budget. Um, golden Ra- three Golden Wet Raspberry Awards for Worst Supporting Actor in Rodman, Worst New Star Rodman, and Worst Screen Couple Rodman and Van Damme. The problem is, is when you do something like that, and you're gonna do a buddy comedy, kind of like a buddy comedy action flick, and you have a guy who's not a great actor in Van Damme, then you stick him with somebody who's not an actor at all in Dennis Rodman. You're really not asking for the movie to be successful. Yeah. So that was like their only actor really involved in this movie was Mickey Rourke, and I don't think he was. He's the villain, but I don't even think he's in it that much. Right. So like, it's not. You, know, you 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 take your best actor and kind of put him in the back seat, and you have your two not great actors up front. Uh, not really a good look. So that's why that movie uh, failed. Uh, knockoff. Rob Schneider. Uh, literally a movie about knockoff jeans. <laughs> if anyone remembers that one, I have no recollection of this one. That one was still that was in theaters too. This was when he started to so uh, he did that one theatrically. Uh, I'm not even talking. It's a terrible movie. It's on, that one is on Amazon Prime right now. But again, he kept getting more money. Thirty five million dollars to make that movie. Four, That's obscene. <laughs> Forty four million dollars is how much it made. It's only eighty seven minutes long. Um, that was when Rob Schneider was the go-to sidekick. He was in Demolition Man. He was in Judge Dredd. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they're like, oh, we got this uh, action movie. It was movie. before the, uh, uh, the Gigolo movies? Before Deuce Bigelow, yep. Okay. Um, and then you get like his first, this is when he started doing VOD. Uh, Leon Genere. Uh I don't think I ever saw that one. Um, I don't think it was in. Yeah. $35 million, Again, $35 million budget for a movie that didn't even go to the theaters. So he was getting the, the budget. Um, Universal Soldier of the Return, that was in theaters. I saw that one in theaters uh, just because I was a big fan of the first one. The second one, is that one is terrible. Uh, there's not a lot to talk about um, except for, and it's a movie I haven't even seen yet, but we're going to talk about it just because it kind of revived his career a little bit. And that's JCVD. It came out in 2008. That was a uh, meta... Um, movie where Van Damme plays a fictional version of himself who ends up, he ends up uh, like, he either like ends up taking someone hostage or gets taken hostage. It's something, but it's a very meta like comedy and it actually got really good reviews. I just now figured out the whole JCVD thing. Uh. Yeah. It took me that long, guys. <laughs> uh, so that was a movie, independent film, uh, French made film. Where, like I said, it's like an action film, but he's playing a version of himself in the movie, and it's supposed to be really good. I have yet to watch it. Um, It kind of fits in the line with his Jean-Claude Van Johnson Amazon show, which people liked, but only did not get picked up for a second season. Hmm. Um, Very similar. uh, That one, he plays another version of himself. So he's kind of in on the joke now, which we'll get into when we get into our first review. Kind of plays into that new movie that he just had come out. Um, He was in Kung Fu Panda 2. Uh, he did make an appearance as the villain in Expendables 2, so that was his most recent like theatrical movie. Um, and then a bunch of just stuff that pops up on Netflix that you'll see. Uh, apparently he's in the new Minions movie coming out next year. Um, hmm. Kickboxer Retaliation, The Bouncer, Blackwater, Kickboxer Vengeance, Kung Fu Panda 3. Um, Welcome to the Jungle is another one that I've seen bits and pieces of. Do they have fun in games? Uh, uh, it's it's another comedy. It's like um, Adam Brody from OC. Like that's it's his movie, but Van Damme plays like they're like, they're like on one of those company outings, and Van Damme plays the guy that like had the teacher to like work as a team, but then like a killer gets involved or something like that. I was just quoting Guns N' Roses. Oh, I know you were. Okay, I know you just were. Just making sure. <laughs> I know Guns N' Roses is man. Okay. I'm just not a huge fan. Yeah, man. Like every rose has its thorn and stuff. <laughs> and stuff. Yes, I know it's poison. Uh, they're all the same. Um, oh, the gauntlet is Someone's going to kill me. All right, so let's get ready for our reviews of the week. And this week we start with, it's an all Van Damme show, people. We start with the last Oh, Mercenary. Van Damme it. <laughs> uh, his brand new movie, 2021 French action comedy film. Uh, and yes, they, you can definitely tell that that's what they were going for. Directed by David Sharhan. Uh, with a screenplay by Sharhan and Ishmael Sai Savane. The film stars Jean-Claude Van Damme in the lead role, along with supporting cast that includes 
Albin Ivanov, Asa Sila, and Samira Dekaza. It was released on Netflix on July 30th, so on this last Friday. Um, Jean-Claude Van Damme plays, if you can guess it, like a super spy. And he's like retired, but he's still he's a mercenary, hence the name of Last Mercenary. Uh, so he goes around helping people, getting paid. It, it does have a great opening shot of him doing the splits mm -hmm. that he's become famous for, obviously, uh, on top of the ceiling. And the fact that it's most likely still him doing it at, like, almost 60 years old right. uh, is pretty impressive. Um, yeah, this was surprisingly entertaining, honestly. It, I, it, I have a problem with reading. Like, I've got mm -hmm. some mild dyslexia in there, so... Being that it's a French film and it's got American subtitles or English subtitles in there, it's got the American subtitles. I tell you what, speak American, damn. I'm trying to read my language. I tell you. Anyway, so a little bit hard to follow, but really, just you can tell just by what the way they set it up. You don't need to understand exactly what they're saying. To you get don't really, yeah, yeah. So. It it is definitely uh, one of these French like lighthearted, uh, not spoof, but kind of it flirts the line with that a little bit. But it's yeah. it's just like. They love these little comedies like this, and it fits. You can tell it was Van Damme wanting to get in that business, I yeah. guess. Like, let's make one of those movies. It's very... That genre is basically made for someone like him. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean... He's got somebody, some comedy yeah. chops, I'd say. He, uh, he, can't, he doesn't have to take himself too seriously. Exactly. And, you know, he's not the greatest actor, so when he can no. be lighthearted, it's like if he flubs up a line, you can just kind of go with it. It's like, it's actually a really good take. We'll use that. Yes. And they have uh, the uh, little... Uh, the meta nod, if you will, when he walk, when they walk into the movie room and he sees the blood sport poster yeah. and he goes, ha, it's my kind of guy. Yeah. <laughs> it's, exactly. a, it's a good line. Um, it, it, so basically the plot is his son has immunity through in the, in the country, in France. Uh, so they can't, he can't be charged with the crime, that kind of stuff. Uh, for, uh, usually that's for like rich people's kids from other countries. Yes. Um, well, some guy who actually ends up becoming one of the better characters in the film decides to delete, like, oh, I see some bad stuff happening here. I'm going to delete it, not realizing that somebody else was using his son's identity to commit crimes mm -hmm. so he couldn't get in trouble. Um, so when they – because everybody knows that the guy using his son's name is a bad dude, as soon as they lift it, they go out and they try to arrest him. Well, the address they go to is his actual son's, who his son is just kind of a, a wuss. Yes. Lack of a better word. Um, and not as tough as his father doesn't know who his father is. So then that means they, they get him. So then Van Damme has to like kind of come out of hiding and right. save his son and save his reputation while also saving France because the guy that stole the, the uh, identity is also trying to sell like a, this thing to a, a terrorist organization or whatever, you know, whatever, all these movies. The, that's it's kind of, it's it complicated, yes. and it's, they didn't have to make it so overtly complicated. They did not. The first hour mm. of this movie, I wasn't sure what, like, if I liked it or not. It was, like, the last, like, 40 minutes where they, they really get to a lot of the comedy where I started to really enjoy the film. Right. Well, just the nod the, the nod to Al Pacino and Scarface with yes, the, uh, the yes. iconic soundtrack. Push it to the limit. Having a character who's basically his bad guy persona is because he watched Scarface a bunch of times. Yeah. It was kind of hilarious, and it did work, I think, for the movie. Um, yeah, and, I, you know, Van Damme holds his own in this. I, I'd say uh, he um, does the kind of a master of disguise, if you will, so we get to see him in several different outfits. Yes. Uh, the long-haired blonde Van Damme was my favorite. Yes, sure. yes. The, uh, was that the, when he was the pool, the pool yes. boy? Yes, yes. <laughs> There's, there are some definitely good comedic moments. Uh, there's lots of good, like, guys get hit and flying into shit. Like, there's that yeah. kind of stuff. Um, it had a good, like I said, I touched that already, got a good comedic value to it while it still being an action flick. Yes, exactly. Um, but it's not, you know, it's not a balls-to-the-walls action flick, which may turn some people off of it, expecting that type of movie right. from him. Uh, but it does have enough, I think, to hold over those people, plus it is funny enough and mm -hmm. And cheery enough um, to enjoy. I mean, it was. Yeah, I had a good time with it. Whether whether I would say it's a great film or not, probably not. But it's a very enjoyable. Yeah, one. it's a it's an enjoyable above average film yes. for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm glad that the Last Mercenary was this way because if they tried to do like Van Damme from the late '80s, this ultra tough guy, yes. still, you know, it's like, dude is showing his age. Yeah. As much as he's trying to, you know, fight off Father Time, 
know, he looks like <laughs> he, a, an older gentleman. He looks now. older. He's definitely wearing hair plugs or a toupee or both. Right. Um, so he's losing his hair. Just shave it off, Van Dam. I, I, that's what I'd say. But hey, you know what? You teach their own. But I could tell as we worked with someone who was a monster truck driver who also had hair plugs, I could tell that's what they were. Um, <laughs> won't mention that person by name just to keep that to myself, but if you know us and you know Monster Jam, you know who we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, if you're looking for something for a good time, it kind of came out of you know nowhere. I saw a trailer for it like a couple weeks ago that it was going to be debuting on Netflix. Yeah. It kind of light this week, so I was like, oh, let's give that a watch. It's a new Van Damme movie in 2021. Who would have thought that Netflix would add a new right. Van Damme movie? This year, so I if, thought that part was again touching on pro wrestling. If they're going to keep marching out Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair and all these, <laughs> yes, you know, antiques from the eighties, you know, got to still have love for them. But yeah, let's just move on. You know? <laughs> but Van Dam, you know, good on you for this movie. Yes, Thank you. yes, a very. And the posters, they have a lot of fun with the posters and the opening credits too. You can tell what kind of movie you're in for when yes. it starts. Uh, it's not to be taken seriously at all, um, and it's just like I said, it's just a good time. So then it gets us into our next movie, which I passed over on his uh, list, obviously, because we are reviewing it. Um, so this week we actually get back to doing kind of an older movie that we never saw. And I didn't realize, actually, that it kind of would tie in somewhat to this newer movie because it was it's from 1999. It's called Inferno. But Inferno was like almost his first attempt at like a comedy. Yeah. Like Inferno was very lighthearted. Um, it's not a good movie. Really, and it's shot the, like it's the, on Amazon. It's in full screen, so you have to deal with that. Four as by well. three. Yeah, yeah. And um, I didn't. <laughs> I was taking uh, I, my notes are somewhere else, but um, I actually, you know what? They're right here. Let me grab my notes, people. Yeah. Uh, I actually was really. I didn't look at the cast, so when I saw who was in this movie, I was like, <laughs> okay, you know, I'm familiar with this, and I actually did enjoy this movie a lot, quite a bit, okay. more than I thought I was going to. Yeah, up until the the scene that most people would have gotten excited about, <laughs> if you know what I'm talking about. There's more than just two of them in that bed. Yep, I know. I'm what like, you're okay, about. okay. Um, but aside from that, you know, the action is good for you know, good quote unquote, yes. good bed. Uh, Eddie Lomax, that's yeah. who Van Dam plays. Um, the motor, there's the opening scene with the motorcycle and a coyote because that's like his nickname. So what's the fun- fabulous Johnny Trejo? Danny Trejo. Johnny. Johnny 23 from... Johnny, yeah, he plays Johnny in this one, too, actually. Yes. Uh, Johnny Six Toes in this one. But, so here's what I wrote down, and we know the answer now, but at the beginning of the movie, I didn't know. I wrote Danny Trejo, parentheses, ghost, question mark, because yeah. he's talking to him, but then you realize he's not actually there. But then, for some reason, when he gets shot and left for dead in the desert, Dan, the actual Danny Trejo, Johnny Six Toes, saves him, but you're still not sure if he's real or not. Who leaves their buddy drunk in the <laughs> desert? I mean... Well, I would have a hard time carrying you out of the desert, oh, but I would sure. not just leave you. <laughs> well, you know, I may leave to go get help, exactly. but I would at least cover you so you're not... Well, but see, it still begs the question. I think he was still hallucinating when he was drunk, but it was just a weird coincidence that he was hallucinating him when he was drunk, and then he came and rescued him later. I think we can assume that he was going to see John. Yes, yes. So. Well, and he was there to commit suicide. Yeah. Um, he, I wrote down Jesus War Hero because he does lay down like he's on the cross at some point. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, Left for Dead. Uh, Pat Morita plays a handyman with kind of a British accent. <laughs> like, I didn't notice it till later in the movie. And I'm like, wait a minute. Is he using a British accent? Why can't they just let Pat Morita talk his normal American, English dialect? Yeah, English because he's from America. He's from California, everybody. <laughs> Uh, if you don't know that about Pat Morita, he did. If you watch Happy Days, that's how he actually sounds. Yeah. Um, Larry Drake is the villain. Always plays the villain. One of my favorites, uh, Doctor Giggles. Uh, he was the villain in Dark Man as well. Um, oh, that <laughs> when he kills when he kills the two people in the uh, in the gun store and no one gave a shit. Everyone's yeah. like, oh, are they dead? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just like, <laughs> well, the fact that, you know, they're, what is it, the grandfather, the uncle? The uncles, just, they got the uncle uh, shackled to a yeah, lazy boy. Yeah, in the, ba- in the back of the store. How could he not, how could no one ever not hear him? He's not that far away from the front of the store. They told him that he was in the hospital. Mm. Uh, so they were bad dudes. So I guess that's why no one cared that he was dead. Uh, there, was the, there was the great line, though, where he threw the knife and he said, catch this. Mm-hmm. And the guy caught it with his chest. Yes. That, that was pretty great. Um. 
there are lots of shots that are held way too long. I don't know if you noticed that, where they would be like, like just on your face, and it's like you say something, and then they're like 30 seconds later they cut. I'm like, what, God, really? Can we move it along here? And I'm sure it wasn't 30 seconds, but it was too long. It was long enough to make it uncomfortable. Yes. Um, <laughs> the fact that they described that that uh, Pat Morita can fix anything means that he can apparently also get rid of dead bodies. I don't. I didn't know where that fit into being a handyman. And all he did was dump them <laughs> off a cliff. He didn't actually. He didn't burn them. He didn't put them in, in, in a, a barrel or anything. He literally dumped him into like a uh, like a garbage dump or just off a cliff somewhere. Um, I I enjoyed the older couple. The one the one lady yes. is a you know talking about her faith and she's a Pentecostal. Yeah. She's dancing around with a snake uh, and I'm like, but she's also got a problem with the bottle. And she's also kind of a pervert too. As we see, is there's a scene with Van Damme and two uh, lovely ladies that happens later in this movie, which kind of came out of nowhere as well. Um, as they sit, they go to thank him, and then he just drops his towel. Um, but he's still wearing his boots. I yes, give him credit for that. He's still wearing his boots after he got out of the shower, which doesn't make any sense. Um, Pat Morita, this is a line from the movie. I bet he gets lots of pussy. <laughs> That yeah. was coming out of uh, Pat Morita's mouth. That one was a bit strange. Yeah. Um, I know. I, I, I'm not sure about this, but I think uh, Jeff uh, Cober, um, Jacob Hale from yeah. Sons of Anarchy, was uh, one of the goons. He was, yep. He was okay. one of the goons. I recognized him right away. Yeah. And then, uh, uh, was that Jamie Presley? Yes, Jamie as, Presley uh, plays Dottie, uh, one, Dottie of yep. yes, yes. one of the waitresses. Yes, yes. One of the waitresses. There were a couple actors in there, too. Um, one that was kind of offensive. Um, Played by a white Italian man who plays an Indian person. Uh, oh, Shivali, right? Yeah, yeah. That, Vic, yeah Victor I, Shivali, the late Victor Shivali, great character actor. Vincent Shivali, sorry. Vincent. Yes. Uh, but yeah, the, it's very not very PC. Uh, Silas Ware Mitchell from. Um, uh, not really well acted. It's just that yeah. whole thing was just. Awful. Oh, that was kind of weird. Oh. Like just have him be someone else. Um, what's his? Uh, what show was this guy on? Uh, Grim. So Silas uh, Ware Mitchell from Grimm, uh, he plays one of the, the heavies or the baddies, whatever you want to call them. Um, Lee Turgeson plays one of the motorcycle guys at the very beginning. Uh, he is from Oz, and that's like his only scene. I was like, oh, Lee Turgeson, and then he disappeared. Right. Um, and, yeah, you here's Jeff Cobert, you said. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a really weird, strange movie because they do rely heavy on comedy in this one, yeah. which I thought was a weird choice. But it, it works at times. I you know it, it's a, like I said, it's a bad movie. I love that they stopped the gunfight to discuss why they were trying to kill each other. Yes. I'm like, <laughs> wait a minute. Okay. That is a on. great. Yeah. Why did you Why did you even try to attack us? And he's like, hold on, hold on. Wait, Everybody stop what? firing. I'll tell you what. <laughs> no. There are so many strange things. The other interesting thing about this movie is John G. Albertson, yes, who, who directed Rocky. And the Karate Kid directed this movie. It was straight to home video. It was his last film that he did. He died 18 years after this movie was made, and this was the last film that he did. So that should tell you how people felt about it, I guess. You know, if you, when you make something like that, it's like, you know what? I'm done. No. I, I'm just, it's <laughs> over. So let me say, Danny Trail, you find out he is a real person. He is still alive. Mm -hmm. Until he's not alive anymore. He does eventually die in the movie. Um... In a very kind of silly way where he, to save him, I guess, he like knocks him unconscious and then he rides out pretending, like with the cowboy hat, so they think it's him and then they hang him and then they shoot him and then Van Damme saves him, but it's too late, he's dying or whatever. Yeah. And then the woman is really, R Rhoda or Rhonda, she's really Rhonda. upset that uh, Johnny Six Toes has died. Who she couldn't even remember who gave her the recommendation that <laughs> her apple pie is, will put a smile on your face. Yes. But you know who never but, heard of him. But she, but she cries tons of tears for him. <laughs> Such a strange, strange movie. I did really enjoy this movie. Like I, I didn't say I shouldn't really enjoy, it, but I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought. Well, I and was, some, so. in some of these bad movies we talk about, doesn't mean just yeah. because I'm saying it's a bad movie doesn't mean you're not going to get enjoyment out of it. Right. It is entertaining. It's short. It's 96 minutes. Um. So it 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 breezes through. Um. It's available on IMDb uh, TV. If you have Amazon Fire Stick, you can get that. Set up very quickly on there for free. Yeah. Um, it does have commercials though. The only it's the only downside. Uh, yeah, so I mean, it's out there. It's you know, again, that's it's been a Van Dam uh, show. So that's another one to go check out if you're interested on Amazon Prime via IMDb TV. All right, so 
as I started doing last week, I'm going to keep doing this uh, until I feel like I don't want to, or maybe I'll switch it up and do something else. Uh, Mike's horror pick of the week. This week, I chose another female-centered horror film. This one is called American Mary, a film by the Soska sisters. It is about a um, girl who is like wants to be a surgeon, but she's not actually a doctor. So she does like weird surgeries and stuff on her own. And it's, it's as it's described in the back, a Frankenstein for the 21st century. It's very bloody. It's very gory. It's on Shudder right now. So if you have Shudder, uh, check it out there. Your description makes me think of human centipede. <laughs> it's not like that. Because you know I don't like that kind of gross stuff like that. I, I prefer the blood and guts, not the, the uh, other bodily fluids. Those are gross. Um, so, yeah, it, she basically is like an outcast. And uh, here, here we go. Here's what it says in the back. Disillusioned with medical school and perpetually broke, med student Mary Mason finds herself drawn into the shady world of underground surgery and body modification. Uh, so she gets involved in this nasty bit of underground world where she's doing these procedures for people. And obviously the cops end up like finding out and getting involved and stuff like that. So it becomes kind of like a to catch a killer, but the killer is the main character. So it's one of those movies where it's, you're not really rooting for her, but it's a very interesting watch. Um, it stars Catherine Isabel from Freddy vs. Jason and Ginger Snaps. Definitely a high recommendation from me. Um, I just saw this probably like maybe two years ago for the first time. And I was, as you can see, I, I liked it so much I bought the Blu-ray. Um, it really just a solid flick. And it, if you like gory, nasty movies, it's definitely up there. And it's, I, again, when they say body modification, it is, I mean, you're, you aren't wrong when they talk about, when you talk about human centipede, because they do sew body parts together. It's just not the body parts that I want to see. So not that I want to see body parts. So together. That was weird on my part. Uh, <laughs> where are you going? Um, it reminds me very similar of a movie called May which is a movie about a girl who's building a body out of human body parts, which I really love, and I've talked about that movie before. Uh, so this one is a more kind of bloodier version of that, but she's not really <laughs> – Wayne is scared. Wayne is terrified right now. <laughs> um, anyway, check out American Mary. It's on Shudder. Uh, definitely worth your time, if it's that type of movie that you like. All right, Wayne. <laughs> Whatever you say, sir. <laughs> Let's go into our uh, movies we've watched recently. Anything you want to talk about? Uh, working my way through the He-Man series on Netflix right now. Still very, very good. Um, not exactly sure where it's going, but it's entertaining all the same. Okay. Uh, in my downtime, you know, winding down before bed, we're going through the Big Bang Theory yet again, because, well, that's what <laughs> we do. Uh, I, nothing else that was memorable to watch. But. Okay. Um, I watched Our Friend on Amazon Prime with uh, Casey Affleck, JC, Jason Segel, and Dakota Johnson. I uh, really enjoyed that movie. It is about cancer, so it is sad. It's a true story, though, about a reporter whose wife gets cancer, and they, his best friend is called in to help and decides to basically stay all the way until the end. Mm. And it's it's very emotional, uh, really a great, solid flick. Uh, one I had been meaning to see for a long time. Finally got a chance to watch it a week or so ago. Really liked it. Um, I watched one called Scare Me on Shudder, and uh, it's a horror comedy kind of in a way that it's not very scary, though, but <laughs> it's one of those movies where people, they're, two people get caught in the dark and they're telling scary stories. Instead of it being one that I thought it was where you would cut to the, like, the actual scary stories they're telling, they act out the scary story. So, But what they did was really cool is they edit in all the sound effects that you would kind of make up in your head are mm -hmm. in the movie, but it's them doing it. So it's, <laughs> and sometimes you'll see like a shadow of like a dog walking, but it's like them kind of make it's, it's really creative and really inventive. It's going to probably piss off a lot of people because it's not very scary. Um, and it's called scare me, but it really, it, it is actually a pretty good comedy and it has a pretty dark ending, uh, which I liked. So uh, mm -hmm. definitely uh, check that one out. The Hills Run Red is a movie from 2009 that's very similar to Texas Chainsaw and The Hills Have Eyes. Uh, a movie director has a lost movie that no one's ever seen that people want to want to find. A, a kid sets out to find it, um, and it turns out he gets more than he bargained for and is dun, like dun, dun. part of the movie type of thing. It's a pretty sweet movie. I like that one. Very gory. Uh, the Doorman with Ruby Rose and Jean Reno. Skip that one. 
Uh, Blood Red Sky. This is one that if you describe it to people, they're going to look at you like, really? Like, I'm not going to watch that movie. It's, an airplane. Do tell. it's an airplane with vampires on it, okay? <laughs> but it's actually done like a very serious, like, hostage film. Like, say, like, Air Force yeah. One or Passenger 57. Let me say, when you told me about Train to Busan, you're like, zombies on a train. I looked at you and like, what? But I'm telling great you, great movie. So I will. No, wait. I'm telling you, it's on Netflix. It's in German and English. Uh, that's how the some characters are in, speak English, some characters speak German. Um, it it's set up like Air Force One, like these people take over a plane, but they don't realize that one of the people on the plane is a vampire, and she's on her way to. New York to get like a blood transfusion, which if you've seen the movie Near Dark, that's how they cure vampirism in that movie. Ooh. So it's similar taken from that. She's with her son. Um, she knows how dangerous she can be. And so like when these terrorists take over the plane led by Dominic Purcell uh, from Blade Trinity, uh, they don't realize what they're dealing with. And so mm-hmm. it, it really, it, it seriously like think passenger 57, but Wesley Snipes is actually playing Blade. That's See, I, I am sold. <laughs> Sign me up. Get the popcorn. We're watching this. <laughs> That's a good one. I really, Rebecca and I really like that one. Uh, the Power, another one on Shudder that was uh, a decent ghost story. The other one we watched recently we really liked is The Boy Behind the Door. Uh, the only reason I laugh when I read that is because I put it on and I was like, this is going to be a good ghost story. She loves ghost stories. Not a ghost story. Two kids get kidnapped by pedophiles. <laughs> That's what the story is. But it's a really great, like, thriller or horror movie where you're rooting for these kids to get out of this creepy, creepy house. Um, so it was, I hope so. It was one of those things where it was like, I thought it was a ghost story. I'm sorry. Like, Rebecca's like, are they going to be okay? I'm like, I don't know. Uh, it's a, it's a, but it was a really, really good movie. Very intense. 89 minutes long. On Shutter. You can rent it anywhere. Uh, definitely check that one out. Uh, we just finished up. I finished up Virgin River. Solid show. Good drama. If you haven't seen that, it's on Netflix. Wayne, I know, has already watched it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, we just finished yesterday. It's a, a mini series on Peacock called Dr. Death with uh, Joshua Jackson, Christian Slater, and Alec Baldwin. It is fantastic. Uh, it's a really good eight episode series. Um, Joshua Jackson plays really creepy on this one, Wayne. I know you're a big. Dawson's Creek fan. This is a different role for him. Uh, he plays quack, it really quiet, quiet. That Get is well. Doctor, <laughs> yes. doctor Quack. Yeah, uh-huh. I got it. I got it. Uh, Mighty Ducks people, if you don't realize that, um, Charlie I'm from so Mighty Ducks. <laughs> and it, it does a good job. Like it cuts back between him. Like so, basically, it's a true story of a doctor who thirty-three of his thirty-eight surgeries that he performed were messed up. Thirty-three out of thirty-eight were messed up. Like it, like taking a hammer and just, like, hammering bone for, like, no apparent reason and not getting the job done. So Christian Slater and Alec Baldwin played two real-life characters who made it their life's work basically for the, for about five years from 2012 to 2017 to make sure he never operated again. Wow. He kept getting through doors. People, because they're, it, the way Texas was working back then is, like, you can... You, you can didn't, stop at Texas. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's, explains it all. That's basically it. And it really is kind of crazy... When they explain it to you and why he was able to get away with what he got away with, it's nuts. Um, but Alec Baldwin's character makes a really good point because they—they're like their question is: Is he really bad or is he doing this on purpose? And they, the show does a good job of making you not—not not really giving you that answer. It wants you to kind of get there yourself. But Alec Baldwin puts it to a, a great point at the end of the show, and this is—it's—it's it's a true story, so you can look it up. Christopher Dunch is the as the surgeon. Um, he's now in, in prison for life, so that should help help you justify watching the show. Um, Alec Baldwin's character says, after, if I had one, he's a surgeon too, he's like, after one surgery like that, if I had one surgery where I messed up somebody that poorly, I, w- I would make sure I never operated in an operating room again. Mm-hmm. So the fact that he had 33 of them leads him to believe to the idea of that he must have been doing this on purpose because at a certain point, your own mind would tell you to stop doing it. And he didn't have that. It's kind of like if Dexter became a surgeon. That's how I looked at how Jackson was playing. When you think about it, Dexter kind of was a surgeon. It's true. He was. Um, But a professional one who got to work in hospitals um, while they were still alive. (laughs) Well, they were alive for a little while. (laughs) I mean, the people he murdered, yes, but because he used to deal with all the dead bodies of of the police. He was the forensics guy. Um, That was my point. 
Uh, but yeah, it's a solid show. It, it's, a, I mean, it's eight episodes, but it's still a pretty quick watch and it's a lot of, a lot of, I shouldn't say fun, but it really intriguing, intriguing. Yes. And Christian Slater and Alec Baldwin deserve their own TV show because they are amazing together. It's you basically have Alec Baldwin as the straight man and Christian Slater as the kind of like over the top funny one. And it's it, for that type of a show that that's that serious. It really worked for that show. And I really wanted. I'm like, man, they need more. Like, can we get a sequel series where they're working to like stop cases or stop another crazy surgeon? Buddy cop drama. Yes, <laughs> I, I would. I would definitely like that as, uh, very much. As everyone knows, I'm a huge Christian Slater fan, so that definitely. Would be right up my alley. Um, all right, so news. Uh, Pokemon live action Netflix series is in the works. Ellen Burstyn is returning for an Exorcist trilogy sequel film series from David Gordon Green, who did the Halloween movies. Uh, Leslie mm-hmm. Odom Jr. is already listed as the star of that film series. It's $400 million uh, Peacock and Universal paid for this franchise that they're getting. There'll be direct sequels to the original Exorcist film. Hopefully Linda Blair will return. They haven't really said yet. Um, but David Gordon Green did the Halloween series, the new one, and I really I like how it started. So I'm, I'm I'm hoping that he's going to put the same you know thought and stuff into this franchise. Uh, we'll see. Um, let's see. Will Smith and David Leach's Fast and Loose picked up by Netflix. Rajon uh, Paul from Bridgerton to star in imagined ver- reimagined version of The Saint for Paramount. Hmm. Lakeith Stanfield and Tiffany Haddish to star in the new Haunted Mansion film. A Waterworld sequel TV series is in the work with Dan Trackenberg directing the pilot. Uh, Taika Waititi making a live action Flash Gordon film. Interesting. Yep. It was supposed to be animated, but they've announced this week it's going to be a live action. Tom Hanks joins Wes Anderson's next film with Tilda Swinton, Adrian Brody, and Bill Murray, who are already on board and are regulars in his films. It'll be the first time Tom Hanks works with Wes Anderson. Uh, and just announced today, the boys renewed for a fourth for a fourth season, while three is still in production. So obviously things are going very well for the boys. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jensen Ackles uh, from Supernatural joins the cast for season three. The other big thing, and Wayne alluded to uh, this week, is Scarlett Johansson has filed a lawsuit against Disney. Um, a lot of uh, it, it, I'm not sure it's really like ten million dollars or something like that. 50. Or is it 50 million? Well, 50. they're saying she lost like 50 okay, million dollars. Yeah, but I, I think the lawsuit stuff was like that. Regardless, the money doesn't matter. Because people are going to be like, oh, well, she got paid 20 million. When you make these movies and you make big tentpole movies like this, you signed a back end deal. And that's based on the movie being released in theaters only initially. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes you may even get a back end from home video sales, that kind of stuff. Right. But like, it's very known that Robert Downey Jr. made $50 million off of the Avengers movie, just off the box office, not yeah. off his salary. Um, so while we, a little peon sit down here, we may get upset and get on our keyboard and start typing how, how um, can she do this? She's already getting 20 million. It's not about the money. It's about getting what you're owed. Yeah. Right. Disney made a deal and they reneged. They that. honor. And yes. And, the problem with – and people don't understand this, but I, I've listened to a lot of movie podcasts, so I know that I hear this all the time and I read the stories. The studios will actually – so they'll make a movie that, say, it makes $100 million over its budget. Well, mm-hmm. that's – to the the actor, okay, well, you made this much money over. I'm supposed to get this much percentage when you of the over that you made. Right. Well, the studio will do is they'll go, oh, but hold on. we got to add in the marketing. Oh, oh, but then we spent more money overseas to promote it too. And then we spent, you know what? Actually, we only made $18 million off this movie. Yeah. And then what you find out, usually what happened, is that extra money that they made, the extra $78 million, was split up between the executives. Of course it was. At the, or $82 million. $82 million. It was split up between the executives at the company. Mm-hmm. And so, therefore, when it's left over, all they have to pay their star is $18 million of gross. But maybe the deal was only if the movie made twenty million dollars. Yeah. So then they get nothing. So that's what in her contract they were it supposedly what it says is that she was supposed to make they were only supposed to release it in theaters first, and they didn't do that. So when they knew that this plan, this is one thing I've been seeing online because apparently now uh, Emma Stone is also yes. considering you know, filing a lawsuit. And her for movie Cruella. made her, yeah for Cruella. Her movie made way less than Black yes. Widow. So. Um, what Disney should have done, would have been the smart thing, is to get this all hammered out before the movie started, was released. Right. You know, like, knowing that this was what was going to happen, 
they should have said, okay, we're going to kick her this much extra money because we're going to do this. Or we're going to give her what they could have done. We're going to give her a percentage of the home video market, which right. they didn't do. And the home video market opening weekend for Black Widow was $60 million. Exactly. So that which adds, if you add that to the box office, we're talking about a $140 million movie, which only to, to her looks, you know, to her contract looks like an $80 million movie, which is what it opened to. Um, so it's, there's a lot to play here. The only thing is the way I, you know, the reason we talk about it and the way I look at it is it's like basketball. You always they always complain when players leave teams because they want more money elsewhere. Or they or they're going to do this elsewhere, and they always for some reason people always back the teams, even though the teams yeah. are run by billionaire one percenters mm. that nobody likes. Movie studios are the same. Disney basically owns everything. Yeah, and it's funny to me to see people like defend Disney, who doesn't need defending by the way. Yeah, and you don't have to care. You don't have to care about Scarlett Johansson's lawsuit. You don't have to care that she. Has that money, but just understand that she's not suing because she wants more money necessarily. That's obviously the goal, but she is suing because she wants them to honor their contract. It's the equivalent of your employer do something wrong, and then your neighbor is taking your employer's side. Yes, exactly. It's it's, it's, it's cut and dry like that. It's like well, and people have been putting online this Stockholm syndrome yes. thing that we have for oh my dad Disney or just the I can't believe she's not loyal to them or what whatever have you and and not only so we have the Corella one possibly on the outcome. Gerard Butler suing the the makers of uh, Olympus Has Fallen because same thing they're they're claiming they only made so much money he had a deal where he got a pro- he's a producer on all three of those films he had a deal where he gets a profit of that movie he's he's the one suing for ten million that's what it was mm-hmm. so Gerard Butler suing uh, Millennium Films and New Image I think for ten million dollars because of back end money that he believes right. that he is owed he is the face of that franchise he's the only reason that franchise makes any money. Um, so, yeah, so this is, I think, opening up, like, what you're seeing is Scarlett Johansson is probably the biggest person that could come out and do it. Right. And so now that she's done it, you're going to get other people go, okay, well, if she's going to do it and not care what they say about her, then I'm going to do it. Right. And granted, like, and what Disney did was very shady. They released how much money she made on the movie up front, which we all know, Robert Downey Jr., Chris Evans, Scarlett Johansson, Chris Hemsworth. Uh, now, especially Robert Downey Jr., make that much money per movie, and Scarlett Johansson make that much money per movie. We know that. That started mm-hmm. in the 90s with Jim Carrey when he was making $20 million a picture. It's ridiculous that they make that much money, money to make movies. But you know what? We go see those movies, so that means that's how much money they're worth. It's the same thing with football players. If people stopped watching the game, stopped going to the games, players wouldn't make that much money. But people don't, so they make that much money. It's the same with the movie business. Mm-hmm. If you stop going, they'll start paying them less. But – People still go, and people still spend the money at home. These movies still make money, so the salary shouldn't really be your real. Oh well, she's got enough money. That's not what. That's not why she's suing. That's going to be the outcome. Obviously, she's hoping to get to recoup the money that she's owed. Mm -hmm. But that the it's more the principle of the thing than anything. So it's just one of those things that I think when we see one rich person arguing with an ultra rich person, we kind of have the tendency to be like. Oh well, what the hell are they arguing about? They have everything, right. but that's not what it's about. And they also put out there too that she doesn't care about the pandemic, which was <laughs> something that you can't you can't say as yeah. Disney. Like maybe she doesn't, I don't know, but you can't say that like without having any proof to back that up. So, and I know Kevin Feige apparently he hasn't come out publicly, but the rumor is behind the scenes he is very upset with Disney yep. and how they handled this. Um, so we'll see going forward if they're. A little more, um, it was weird for them to come out and attack one of their main stars, who also happens to be a female, uh, and they've never really attacked any of their male stars. Now, granted, I don't know that their male stars have been any, any of these issues, but it, it doesn't look good for Disney when you come out and do this, and I believe, I don't know what movie it was, but she had just signed on to be in one of their next big, like, mm. ride, Disney ride movies, or whatever it was. Yes. Um, so I don't know if that'll affect this or, or not. We'll find out. But yeah, we felt compelled to talk about this, you know, in the, the movie and filmmaking biz. Yes. So, agree with us, disagree with us, hey, let us know. You know, we we are always interested in what your guys' thoughts are on these things. Also, drop your Van Damme comments as well, you know. We've got yes. our Facebook and our uh, Instagram links right here. So and This will be going up. up on a YouTube page, so uh, you'll get to watch this there, and you can comment there as well. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, release is coming out. Dexter, New Blood, November 7th on Showtime. So excited. King Richard with Will Smith about uh, Serena and Venus's father, uh, who kind of like helps 
start their careers as tennis players. Obviously, they're responsible for being the great tennis players that they are. But mm-hmm. and he's apparently got a very interesting backstory. So we're going to get that get to see that November nineteenth in theaters and on HBO Max. Death Rider and the House of Vampires from director Glenn Danzig from the band Danzig, starring Devin Sawa, releases August twenty seventh on VOD. Hawkeye coming November twenty fourth to Disney Plus. And then House of Gucci with Adam Driver, Lady Gaga, Jared Leto, Jeremy Irons, Selma Hayek, and Al Pacino hits theaters November 24th, uh, directed by Ridley Scott. He's actually got two movies coming out this year. That's that one and The Last Duel with Matt Damon and Ben Affleck. So busy Mm -hmm. winner for uh, Ridley Scott. Uh, Deaths this week, Ronnie Kramer, filmmaker, artist, uh, dead at 64. Rick Aiello, son of Danny Aiello, the actor who just passed away a couple years ago. Uh, His son also passed away at 65 from pancreatic cancer. Joey Jordison, founding member of Slipknot, dead at 46. Dusty Hill of ZZ Top, dead at 72. Mm-hmm. And Ron Papelli, infomercial legend who was spoofed on SNL, dead at 86. I also do want to mention, we did have a scare in the Hollywood uh, business this week as Bob Odenkirk had a uh, heart yes. attack on set of Better Call Saul. Uh, I know a lot of people on Twitter and stuff, it was a, a rough day because there were no announcements going on and how he was doing, but he is okay, he's recovering uh, they did not have to do surgery. So if you're a fan of Bob Odenkirk, you have, if you have seen haven't seen Nobody, definitely check out Nobody because it's mm-hmm. well worth your time. Um, but obviously Better Call Saul, too. Uh, great show, and he was on Breaking Bad. So yeah. he's been around for a long time. Best so. wishes to a speedy recovery. Exactly. And that was one of those things, like, you know, it comes out, you know, he's one of, the, like, the nicest guys in Hollywood. So it's, And that's mm-hmm. always how it happens. You know, the people it happens to, right? So, yeah. uh, all right, that's our show for this week. Thank you for watching and listening. Uh, depending on where you're uh, uh, hearing this. Uh, For Wayne Yerke, I am Mike Kirkpatrick. Thank you for listening and watching Now Showing with Mike and Wayne.